Abraham said, well, wait a minute, what if I could find one good individual? Of course, that never works out because, you know, we, we did find one good individual. It was Lot. He went up, he procreated, procreated with his daughters. They begat the, the tribes that were at war with Israel for years, and they were just evil people. Noah never did say, but wait a minute, God, there's, uh, you know, several hundred thousand people here, and why don't we talk about this? He never said that. And I think part of the problem uh, that he realized was it was completely out of control, and it wasn't the people only who were the problems because people can repent. But there are certain things that are born evil. And... Uh, and in, in the book of um, in the book of Jubilees, uh, it makes reference to uh, three types, and it says uh, the Nephilim killed the Elio, the giants killed the Nephilim, and the Elio killed mankind. So we have these giants like. Goliath and his mother and his siblings and all that stuff with six fingers and six toes and they're huge individuals and they're war people. And we have the Nephilim, which were the monsters and the fallen ones. And the Elio, we have no idea that the closest you can come is godlings. So these people, or these 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 watchers that had come down, were were not only spreading all of this stuff through through the land, but they were also messing around with the DNA. Jasher tells us that they started combining animals. They put their DNA in animals. They they took animals' DNA and they and they started combining them and changing them and uh, switching them around and and that was another thing that was going on in the world at the time that couldn't be fixed. It, it was a process that had began and, and it was going on. So you had these, these, these uh, monstrosities out there that were, that were um, combining, breeding, growing, and it had to be stopped. The problem is that these, these sub-creatures, these giants and Nephilim and Elio, some of them were both spiritual and physical. And Enoch tells us that when you kill the body, the spirit went out to torment mankind. And so you had all of these things going on at the same time. So uh, for a being, call him God, set up this ecosystem and then have his underlings come in that were assigned to actually watch the system and document the system. That's why they're called the watchers. Interfere with the system and start changing around the system. Made him want to destroy and redefine the system. And when you put it in practicums like that, you, you, you come out of a place where you think of God and you come into a place where you think of experimentation. The Bible tells us not to mess around with, uh, with plants and just, just take it as it is because the natural stuff is the best and, and don't try to interbreed plants. Uh, that's in the Old Testament paraphrase, of course. But, you know, the problem is that when you have plants that spoil, they spoil because they sustain life. You know, come on now. Let's, let's just be logical about this. Things spoil because things grow on them and in them. And they grow on them and in them because they are nutrients. They are nutrient-rich, and so they can support uh, fungus or bacteria or, or us. Okay, so... So you have a problem in that when you start dealing with hybrid, hybridization, what you're actually doing is at times making it less and less um, able to sustain life. For example, I grow figs. I can take a fig, 
I can put it out. Two days later, it's spoiled because these are really fine figs. I can mix it with sugar, and it'll stay there forever because sugar doesn't support life. You see, so if you look at it like that, then what we're doing to ourselves with gene splicing and all of this is slowly starving ourselves to death. And the Bible says not to do it. And it was one of the problems in the very beginning where the, uh, uh, the, the watchers were starting to mess around with DNA, not only with plants, but with animals. And we think that that might be where we get the harpies and the uh, minotaurs and the centaurs and all of these, these combination creatures. They, they were probably not exactly myth. You know, myth is always based on something. And they most likely came out of the uh, very, very old, very ancient gene splicing experiments that the watchers were doing. And that's what really ticked God off, you see, because uh, I think it was uh, Jasher that said, yeah, you know, they interbred. They, they produced all of these creatures. They were horrible. But when they really started messing around with, with animals and combining animals and putting their DNA in animals and, and switching things around, that's what really got God, and he said we're going to destroy everything. So here we are doing it again. You know, we, we now have taken the place of the watchers. We've gotten our technology up because, see, we knew this before. We were doing this before. The, the, the text says that they taught us how to do this. And so now here we come full cycle again. And, uh, and we're, we're suffering the same consequences. Researchers tell me that we may, may have gone through as many as six extinction cycles in the history of the Earth, some of which may have predated the flood of Noah and some that may have come later, but that, in fact, our archaeology tells us the ancient history and even the um, sacred books who are, which are outside the canon of scripture, seem to indicate that mankind has a proclivity for destroying their civilizations, usually once they reach a certain arc. And some of it has to do with what you've talked about with genetics, but also it looks like they've messed around with energy forces that have created certain conditions that are destructive as well. Yes, uh, I'm in. Uh, I'm a ham radio operator, and we're in a solar cycle right now, the height of the solar cycle, and it should have been uh, an amazing event. The last time this happened, um, I was driving through uh, Rhode Island and uh, just pointed my car toward the ocean and talked to Korea off of uh, less watts than it takes to run a little light bulb. This time. Everyone is looking around going, what is happening here? Uh, the, the, uh, the ionosphere is, is, is not acting right. It, the, the cycle is flat. Something is going on that has just taken the cycle and just crushed it. Uh, communication is, is not uh, as robust. We've done something or something is being done to us. The sun cycle. You know, it's an 11 and a half uh, year uh, sunspot cycle. And according to some of the other texts, this was supposed to be an area of time that the sun starts really acting up. And uh, so there's a lot of energy problems going on right now, both internally and externally to the Earth. And again, I wonder how much of this is natural cycles and how much the cycles themselves have been messed with by scalar technology. We and I don't think you and I have ever talked about this, but the uh, high altitude auroral research project up in Alaska is one mm -hmm. example of what I call scalar energy that seems to be deploying uh, high energy frequencies into the upper <laughs> atmosphere that would in fact, uh, I believe in some cases are attempting to mitigate the solar cycles but may in fact be uh, creating a ripple effect in the uh, upper ionosphere. Do you have any anything? Well, we've been uh, we've been yeah we've been going through uh, some experiments like that for many many years. 
the mm -hmm. Russians had something we call the woodpecker that would go up and down the, the lower frequencies. And you would hear it, and it would just crush whatever communication you had as it just ticked its way mm -hmm. up and down these frequencies. Yep. And it was an over-the-radar, or I'm sorry, over-the-horizon radar. Yes. But it used really low frequencies, but it used tremendous power. So it was it was beaming things, bouncing them off the ionosphere, coming back down and listening for an echo. And uh, so that's been going on for years. And we've just gotten better and better at doing really dumb things like that. Yeah, so we seem to be in these repetitive cycles. I wonder, um, this kind of goes back into mythological history. You know, there's, there's stories of an ancient civilization called Atlantis that seems to have destroyed itself using energy weapons that blew back on them. And, you know, those are, if not historically true, distant echoes of a history that seems to be repeated in the ancient scriptures as well. Yes, and there are apparently some things, creatures, uh, whatever out there that are that are watching, guiding, uh, not toward destruction, I don't think, but just simply uh, kind of a hands-on thing. If you look in the back of one of my books called Angels and Demons, you, you actually see pictures taken from all over the world, starting from 6000 BC. They all look the same. They all look like uh, a diving bell or a, uh, a, a helmet or uh, a space uh, suit, every single one of them. And, and, uh, and they come through all over the world. And, and so you tend to think that there's some kind of a reset mechanism going on. Uh, they're here, they're watching, they're monitoring, and then uh, at the proper time when we destroy ourselves, they hit the reset button and we begin again. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And uh, <laughs> time is running out. Thanks for the fish. We're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so long and thanks for all the fish. Yep. That was his second book, by the way. <laughs> So, you know, what we might not know is uh, the rats are running experiments on us, right? That's what that book was about. Yeah, exactly. They were in higher life forms. <laughs> oh, baby. Uh, so we, we haven't put this together. That's our problem. See, the, we've got pieces of this truth, and we haven't looked at it and said, oh, this, this makes perfect sense now. For example, uh, God tried to destroy all of these creatures, so he sent sends this flood, but he knows, because he's already told him, he knows that it's not going to destroy the spiritual part. That can't be destroyed. So in uh, in Enoch, he has this uh, kind of rant, you might say, where he says, you were in heaven, you were eternal, you were perfect, and, and your place was in heaven, but you came down to earth, and, and you defiled yourself. Their place was earth. They are mortal. That's why they procreate. You, there's no reason to procreate. You're immortal. They are stuck here. But now you've really confused the issue because now you have children and they're both. They're spiritual and they're mortal. And so when you kill them, the spirit goes out from them and does not die. And it doesn't thirst, and it doesn't hunger, and it doesn't sleep, and it just torments men continually. Well, if you want a definition for what we call a demon, there it is. So if you put all of this in, in, into perspective, what you have is the watchers were not the demons. The watchers actually seem to care they, they were stupid, and they made a mistake, and they tried to repent, but God wouldn't have it. He told them that they were going to be destroyed. But along with his uh, rant about what he was going to do with them, he actually said, you're going to see your sons die. You're going to see your offspring, your children killed. You're going to have to watch this. This is going to be torture for you. You care for them. So the watchers came down, 
they taught us things. Jasher tells us that they became our rulers. Well, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? When you have when you have angelic beings come down and um, and they are godlike to our uh, perspective, they become our our rulers. And they took our women, and they raised up these offspring. And these offspring were insane. They they were unstable. Uh, you can't mix uh, that much spiritual power in a mortal body and have nothing happen. Energy in is always equal to energy out and vice versa. And that goes back to what we were talking about with the, uh, uh, the experiments in Alaska. We're in a closed system. We're in a ball. Everything reflects around this ball because of the ionosphere. You can't have energy going out and not have it come back at you. The Atlantean thing, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, for cause laws in, in electronics says that power in must always equal power out. Energy is never destroyed. So back to what we were talking about, this spiritual energy isn't destroyed. The body is destroyed and it decays and it goes back. And of course, it's not lost. It's just reassigned through decay. But the spirit remains and it goes out and it's, in, and it's enraged. It's born insane, you might say. And so now we have demons. And so uh, it begins, well, God keeps on trying to contain this. And he knows that these, these uh, demonic presence, they need a host uh, because they, they, they need something to, uh, to become physical with. So they go out in the wilderness and they inhabit the animals. Well, God tells King Saul to go into the area of, of Amalek. And, the, uh, and that area happens to be the wilderness that all the And he says, kill everything. Anything that walks, anything that moves, don't bring anything back. Kill it all. Don't take anything. Leave all the spoils. It's contaminated. Don't touch it. Just come back. Kill it and come back. What does he do? He grabs the, 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 the sheep and the oxen and, and the king, and he brings them back as part of the spoils. And normally, something like that is just very, very, you know, it's very common, and it's what you're supposed to do. And he comes back and he says, oh, look at what I've got. I'm going to offer this as sacrifice to you. And the reaction is so profound that God rips Israel from his, his hands. The Bible says he just rips Israel out of Saul's hands. He's no longer fit to be king. Well, why? Because he had, he had given those beings a gate to come back in out of the wilderness and recontaminate the people. Now you jump forward, and, and now you know that they're angelic beings, demonic beings, spiritual beings, inhabiting the earth, inhabiting creatures, and now Jesus comes on board and he's going through, and he gets to the Gadarenes, and he meets a demoniac. And he says, who are you? And he says, I'm Legion. And he says, get out of him. And what does he say? Hey, there's some pigs over there. That's where we came from. That's our home. We know how to do this. Let's just go back into the pigs. And he says, fine. Let's go back into the pigs. No worries. And then he runs them off into the river or into the ocean where they didn't expect that. But the stories tend to tie together all of a sudden, because when you bring in the ancient text, you begin to, to look at the, uh, the, 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 the physicality of the, of the whole thing, the, the, the logistics of, of these uh, spiritual beings inhabiting the different creatures. And all of a sudden, the Bible begins to make more sense than it ever has before. Now it has a backdrop to it that we didn't have previously. We really lost something profound when we lost these so-called outside books, books like Enoch, books like Jubilee, and the, thing, the books that were taken out of the King James Bible that gave us a backdrop historically. I had never made the connection between, I guess, what we'll call Chimera 
and the fleeing of these demons back into pigs. Uh, that was a connection I never made before. That's actually kind of unique, Joseph. Uh, we don't know what was going on with uh, Emelech and, and, uh, and his people. They have a sordid history. Uh, Emelech was the son of Esau. Esau was the chief of the Edomites. And the, uh, the people of, the, of Emelech, the name itself means they who lick blood. So we had something really kind of base going on with those people. And uh, when you put the whole story together, you think, oh, that's where they were. That's where they went. Okay. And that's why the whole thing uh, kind of unraveled. So, uh, yeah, here we are. We're stuck with it.